who is uh, from Total uh, ENP Research and Technology, and also Dr. Tim Warburton, who is now at Virginia Tech. Uh, we've been working on what we'd like to call weight-adjusted discontinuous glyrican methods. So I'll try and introduce DG methods, discontinuous glyrican, and then explain why we think weight-adjusted uh, DG methods are a good advance, which should be useful, I believe, for acoustic and elastic wave propagation. All right, so one slide review on uh, DG methods. Uh, I'm interested in DG methods because they approximate a solution using discontinuous piecewise polynomials on different elements. And this structure allows us to use very, very general meshes. We allow for the use of unstructured meshes, including tetrahedral meshes or hybrid mixed element meshes. And if you know, say, some geological feature like this interface or some uh, geometry, then you can mesh very, very closely to these features using unstructured tetrahedral meshes. Uh, this gives us geometric flexibility, but we're also interested in the high order aspect of DG methods. You can go arbitrarily high order accurate in, uh, in space with DG, and this is useful for wave propagation because it reduces uh, some numerical dispersion, dis uh, dissipation features which are present in low order methods. Here I'm just taking a sinusoidal wave, I'll propagate it over a periodic domain for several periods, and if you use a low order, a linear method in this case, you see some unnatural dissipation near the peaks of the solution. If you actually use a coarser mesh, but just increase the order by one, you have a quadratic method, this numerical dissipation almost disappears entirely. Uh, moreover, you can show mathematically that if you look at the convergence of error under mesh refinement, then uh, you s usually see that it converges at some constant slope in a log-log plot. Uh, if you increase the order of approximation, then this slope gets higher and higher, so higher order methods also represent things more efficiently. And finally, on the HPC side, I'm also very interested in working with many Quora architectures. My architecture of choice is a graphics processing unit, but the same applies for OpenMP, for a many core uh, CPUs or Intel uh, fees, the new Intel architectures if you'd like. If you use explicit time stepping with high order DG methods, you can achieve very high performance on all of these architectures. So this is the good, what about the bad? Well, mathematically there's no real issue with, uh, with DG methods, but computationally certain cases can cause, uh, can cause some headaches. So most efficient implementations of DG specifically on triangular or tetrahedral meshes, on the unstructured meshes that I'd like to use, uh, require us to assume a certain type of heterogeneity in our velocity model. So we have to assume that the wave speed or the velocity model is constant over each individual element. It can vary from element to element, but within an element, it has to be fixed. Uh, you also have to have non-curved meshes, so planar uh, triangles or tetrahedra. So if you have a smoothly varying wave field or velocity field, then obviously if you approximate it by constants over every single element, you're going to get discontinuities between different elements. And if you simulate your solution, you can see lots of spurious reflections when you use this low order approximation. Switch to a higher order approximation, voila, all these uh, spurious reflections vanish, but there is a cost associated with this. And that's why I'd like to talk a little bit about how we address this cost, which I'll tell you about soon, using weight adjusted DG methods. Okay. So here's my one mathematical slide, I hope, uh, just introducing why discontinuous glyrican methods, what features of discontinuous glyrican methods we actually, like to, we actually want to uh, maintain. Here's an acoustic wave equation. Uh, I've written in pressure velocity form, and I'll just assume that I have a variable uh, heterogeneous wave speed, which can vary from element to element and within the element as well. Uh, I can construct a local DG formulation by taking both these equations, multiplying each one by a test function, Q and V, and then integrating over an, an element d sub k, or d super k. And then I add uh, coupling terms, numerical fluxes, which couple an element to all its neighbors through its faces. Uh, the advantage of this formulation is that I can get high order accuracy and I can get an energy st uh, stability estimate if I simply take q and v equal to the pressure and velocity and rearrange things slightly, then I get that this quantity, which is in some sense measuring the magnitude, the norm of your solution, the time change of the magnitude of the solution is always going to be equal to this quantity, which is strictly less than zero. So your quantity will be non, you, you won't blow up in time. These are the features that we'd like to preserve, uh, but sometimes we, but we run into issues whenever we have uh, wave speeds which vary in the element level. So these cause us to have to deal with weighted mass matrices. Uh, you can think of the DG formulation as basically being you have some right-hand side for velocity, some right-hand side for pressure, and then you have this integral 
of uh, something involving the time derivative and then the wave speed as well. This translates into a weighted mass matrix which uh, lives next to the time derivative term and we have to invert this at every single time step in order to march along in time using explicit time stepping. Okay, so if we map to a, a reference element, most of the time we compute our mass matrices this way, uh, if these wave speeds and this geometric uh, map, this geometric weighting are constant over the element, we can pull them out and easily invert this matrix just once for every single element in the mesh. However, if either you have curved meshes or heterogeneous media which varies from uh, inside an element, then now you have to introduce a mass matrix with a spatially dependent weighting. And this weighting causes issues because while you want this weighting to be present in order to maintain higher order accuracy and energy stability, uh, it requires us to compute an explicit inverse of a mass matrix over every single element. So whereas before we could invert one mass matrix and apply it to all elements in the mesh, we have to invert these explicitly because they vary from element to element. So both options are not really palatable. You can either assemble these on the fly and invert. This is expensive and hard to parallelize, or you can pre-compute and store. And if you use high order methods, this storage is incredibly expensive. So our approach is simply to approximate and find an approximation which is cheap. So we take our weighted mass matrix and we replace it by this product of three different matrices. You have an unweighted mass matrix, which is the same for all elements, all elements in your mesh, and then a mass the inverse of a weighted mass matrix with an inverted weight. Uh, we found this to be both higher order accurate, we can show this uh, theoretically, and also uh, energy stable. Because this is a positive definite matrix, we can show an, a variation of energy stability holds. The most important part for us is that when we try to invert our approximation, uh, we apply the inverse to this product and we end up only having to invert these reference mass, these unweighted mass matrices. This weighted mass matrix, we only have to apply and that can be done in a very cheap fashion. Okay. Uh, the way we do this is to do a matrix-free application of this, uh, in, of this weighted mass matrix using quadrature. This is low storage and it's efficient on GPUs. We can show that you achieve high performance. And more importantly for us, uh, if you rearrange uh, this weight-adjusted mass matrix equation, then we end up basically getting uh, the right-hand side evaluations for an unweighted problem. We can reuse fast operations or existing uh, frameworks to do these evaluations. And in particular, I'm interested in doing these valuations very quickly, and we've developed some methods to do so in other work. Okay, so this is the method uh, in brief, and I'd like to convince you through some numerical examples that this actually works. All right, for acoustic waves, I'm just, doing, just going to do a couple simple model problems. Here I have a square domain, a uniform triangular mesh, and if I take my wave field to be the spatially varying uh, wave field with some discontinuity along this line, then the standard DG method, where I actually compute and invert every single one of these, in, uh, these weighted mass matrices, gives me a solution like this. Okay, if I switch to a weight adjusted uh, DG, then there's no visual change in the solution at all. Uh, but the visual changes are often not enough. If you actually look at the errors for a manufactured solution, then this visual change goes a little bit deeper. We can show that uh, if you look at comparisons between DG and weight adjusted DG, or WAJ, then here's uh, different levels of mesh refinement. Here's increases in order. As you increase the order and as you refine the mesh, you basically mat the weight adjusted DG method matches the error of the DG method to more and more significant digits. So you have one significant digit at the first refinement, two at the second, and then three at the third, and so on and so on. So this works for both a manufactured solution and a reference solution where I've used a very high, highly accurate method to compare. Okay, uh, if I look at the rates of convergence for this weight adjusted DG method and compare them to DG, we basically get order two for n equals, uh, for order for degree one polynomials, order three for degree two, order four for degree three, and so on and so on. These are the optimal expected rates of convergence that you would want. And this holds also for a reference solution, but you get slightly less because uh, you can show that you can only prove uh, a slightly lower rate of convergence. But in both cases, this weight adjusted DG matches the DG method at much less, uh, at a much a greatly reduced storage cost. Okay, 
I'll just briefly mention. If you apply this to curvilinear meshes, then your, weight, uh, your weighted mass matrices now involve spatially varying weights, which are geometric in nature. And as before, we basically see that the errors for both DG and weight-adjusted DG lie on top of each other. The reason I'm, I uh, like our implementation is also if we use curvilinear meshes and we want to incorporate heterogeneous media on top of that, then we can do so at absolutely no additional cost. This is an example of a radial wave field, which is smoothly varying throughout a domain, and a curvilinear mesh uh, along with a wave that's propagated from a Gaussian pulse about in the middle. Okay. More recently, we've also aimed to try to extend these ideas to elastic wave propagation. Acoustic waves are great, but as we've heard this morning, uh, we do need to incorporate additional physics in order to get some uh, appropriate realism sometimes. So what we found is that we've talked so far about uh, weighted mass matrices when the weight is a scalar function. In uh, this case, we can, when it's a scalar, we can use the weight-adjusted DG method. But it turns out if the, matrix of, if the weight is actually matrix-valued, we can apply the exact same ideas. Uh, to come up with a low storage, and efficient implementation. And in fact, it's even more efficient in this case. So all, let me introduce, these are the equations of linear elasticity in velocity stress form. Uh, we have an evolution equation for the velocity scaled by some density rho, and then an evolution equation for the stress scaled by the constitutive stress tensor. Uh, you have some right-hand side derivatives multiplied by some matrices, but these matrices will always be constant in, uh, in space and time. They're just there to rearrange derivatives terms. So this term, can be hand, uh, this term will induce a weighted mass matrix with a scalar weight. This term, uh, when you discretize using the DG method, will induce a weighted mass matrix with a matrix-valued weight. And this looks like, uh, like so. For every single uh, a weighted mass matrix with a matrix value weight is going to be something like a generalization of a Kronecker product. It's a block matrix where every single block of this block matrix is a weighted mass matrix corresponding to an entry of this constitutive tensor C. So this matrix is huge, dense, fully coupled, but we can show that there exists, so uh, we can construct a weight-adjusted approximation for this mass matrix, which decouples it into individual components and allows us to apply uh, this weighted mass matrix in a cheap, low storage, and efficient fashion. All right, so we apply this approach to come up with a, a DG method for linear elasticity. And if we test on some simple problems, we have Rayleigh waves, Lamb waves, Stoneley waves. In all cases, we basically see as expected convergence. So for order one, we see about 1.5, between 1.5 and two for order two, between uh, 2.5 and three, same for order three, four, uh, five, and so on. We basically see something between the optimal rate of convergence that we expect and then the uh, estimated rate of convergence that we can actually prove. There is a drawback, I should note, that if you have nearly incompressible media, uh, in the case when you, have, uh, uh, when you have lambda, the ratio of lambda to mu going to infinity, then you can show that the norm of this constitutive tensor will blow up to infinity. And this can be problematic. You can see that the error in your stresses will increase in this case, uh, although the error in the velocity uh, remains relatively bounded, thankfully. All right. A couple other nice features of uh, our uh, formulation for elasticity is that we found we can incorporate anisotropy with no real change in our code at all. Uh, this is due to the fact that all our numerical fluxes in our DG method, the couplings between different elements, are completely independent of our physics, our constitutive stress tensor. So the difference between anisot uh, anisotropy and isotropy is just going to be a change in this tensor, which only shows up when you, uh, when you have to apply this weight-adjusted mass matrix. So here's an example from Tromp, Comatish, uh, Barnes, and Tromp, where they have uh, a wave propagating through transverse isot uh, isotropic media on the left uh, and isotropic media on the right. And our results match very closely with those in the literature. Uh, we can also extend this to elastic acoustic coupling without much difficulty. Uh, we simply take an idea that uh, Ru Chao Ye and Dr. Martin De Hoop came up with and apply it to this new setting where you replace interface jumps in interfaces between elastic and acoustic media with residuals of these continuity conditions. Uh, this gives you an energy stable approach uh, method for arbitrary heterogeneous media. And just to show you how, uh, how the solution changes, here's an example of traditional DG methods where you would use a low order approximation to a highly oscillatory wave field 
on a uniform triangular mesh. You end up with a wave that has a lot of spurious reflections, which if you switch to high order method uh, or high order approximation of the wave field are completely removed uh, yeah, from the simulation. Finally, I'll end on just a, a 3D example. Here's an example of isotropic media where I've taken the LeMay parameter mu to be equal to one plus a heavy side function, so you have a discontinuity across this boundary, plus some spatially varying uh, part. Uh, I'm running this for degree five polynomials on a mesh, computational mesh, which looks like so. And if I run this with a piecewise constant approximation of, this, uh, of the constitutive stress tensor, then you end up with some spurious reflections that appear in the middle of, uh, your, of your wave. If you use the weight adjusted DG method and instead switch to a high order uh, approximation of this of C, then these reflections again all disappear. All right. So let me go ahead and just summarize the work we've done. Uh, I think these weight adjusted DG methods show promise uh, for acoustic and elastic wave propagation, and especially in cases when you have when you want higher order accuracy in the presence of heterogeneous media. Uh, we maintain both energy stability and higher order accuracy provably while being low storage, which is important for uh, HPC architectures, especially since data movement starts to cost more and more nowadays. Uh, in the work in the future, we've also found that we can speed this up using the Bernstein-Bezier basis, which I'd be happy to talk about in the future if you're interested. And interestingly enough for us, we found that we can reduce some of the high order stiffness that's artificially found with uh, DG methods by using a novel change of basis uh, and combining it with weight adjusted DG methods. So with that, here are some uh, uh, references and a great thanks to Total for uh, supporting this work and making this all possible. Thank you all. We have time for a few questions. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, so in the case when you have a discontinuity that, say, like lies in the middle of an element, is that what you're wondering about? Let's not say discontinuity. Okay. Just Sure. Areas. So there it gets a little bit more interesting because it depends slightly on the quadrature that you'll use to approximate, the, uh, to approximate this application of this weight-adjusted matrix. Um, if you use a low-order quadrature, then you'll generally just see uh, reducing, you'll, you'll see reduction down to uh, h to the 1 half convergence. Uh, and if you use a higher order quadrature, it gets more expensive, but you can sometimes increase it to h. But generally, you're limited to at least linear or worse. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm using uh, the quadratures constructed by Gimbutas and Xiao. Uh, they're quadratures for triangular and uh, tetrahedral elements up to order um, I think around 10 or so. Uh, so if you'd like, I can share them with you, but they're uh, just from his paper. Any more question? Okay, thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you.